Welcome everybody to the second part of the lecture titled Techniques for Overcoming the Intersymbol Interference Due to Wireless Channels. In the first part of the lecture, we talked about equalization and OFDM. In this part, we will talk about spread spectrum and other techniques as well that are related to the, uh, to the subject of, inter of interference in general. So, spread spectrum is a technique that's used by 3G wireless systems like WCDMA, and others and basically it increases your signal bandwidth whatever it increases your signal bandwidth in such a way that it spreads the modulated signal over wider bandwidth and by reducing the symbol time of your transmitted signal the bandwidth will be very large and it becomes lower than the noise level even so it mitigates intersymbol interference by coherently combining multi-path components because the bandwidth now is, you have short symbol time you have multiple paths you have high resolution and you can utilize this to improve your system performance by having multi-path diversity and combining the signal energy coming from all these multi-paths so also, it reduces the intersymbol interference by spreading the multipath. When the multipath is not spread, it's so significant above the noise level. When you spread it, it becomes under the noise level. We will see in figures now, visualization, how it happens. It hides the signal below noise, as I just said, by, the, by using the technique called direct sequence spread spectrum, or, make it, or makes it hard to track by using frequency hopping. Frequency hopping keeps hopping from frequency to another. So it's very hard to track and you average the interference. If there is an interference on a specific frequency, you don't stay locked to that frequency or using it for a long period of time. You just use it for a fraction of seconds. So you get affected by noise little. On average, you reduce the effect of the interference. And uh, for uh, direct sequence spread spectrum allows you to have your signal below the noise. So nobody can know that you are doing a communication unless you know the code that was used by the transmitter and use it at the receiver side and decode your, your signal. So this is one of the techniques that's used by military to hide their communication. Hide their communication, nobody can know they are communicating with each other. And the second, avoid interference since your signal is not known, not seen, does not, nobody knows at which frequency, interference is, it's immune to interference, robust to interference. Also used as a multiple access techniques, where multiple users are located different codes, and these codes are orthogonal to each other. So each user used the whole bandwidth, whole time, but has a unique code that he can use to uh, spread his signal and the other user has a different code now different code is orthogonal to the first code when they get on top of each other they are orthogonal they don't cause interference each user receive all these composite signals and by using his own code he can get his own signal only does not give although the signal contains the other user signals but you don't get it there are two types for uh, doing spread spectrum frequency hopping narrow band signal hopped over wide bandwidth this is used in gsm 2g systems and direct sequence used in y in w c d m a which is 3g modulated signal multiplied by faster chip sequence why to increase the bandwidth of the signal more than you need and then the symbol duration shrinks and you, your bandwidth, you spread it to a level that its power becomes so little, so low. Everybody knows that your signal, this is the signal of your, this is the power of your signal at a certain bandwidth, yes? If you increase the bandwidth and use the same power, what will happen to the power? comes like this yes because you are using more bandwidth if you increase more your signal becomes like this because the power is confined 
fix the quantity. Increase the power, the bandwidth more, the power distributes on the whole bandwidth. Yes. To increase the bandwidth. Yes. So that the frequency will be low. If you increase the bandwidth, the frequency will be? It will be low. That's when it's low. No, it will not affect the frequency. The, the amplitude, the power of your signal will be low. But the frequency of the bandwidth. Um, this is the bandwidth. This is the bandwidth. The bandwidth is this. The power is this. The, band, the power of your signal will be very low, below the noise level. But the frequency is the same? Same. Frequency same. You are using the same, the whole bandwidth of your system. Originally, the bandwidth is this. After you spread, the bandwidth becomes this. After you spread. So, this is what happens. This is your information bit sequence. This is the purple one. This is your data ones. 1 minus 1, 1, 1 minus 1. This is the data corresponding to 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, something. And this we call it S of T, which is the signal, the information signal you are transmitting. The data rate, it, this is the shape of your signal. Now you multiply it by chip sequence. This chip sequence changes faster than the, the message information. So this, as you can see, Within this whole duration, just one change for S of T, while for SC of T, there are many changes, like 10 changes within this duration. These changes, as if you are reducing the symbol time and the bandwidth will increase. So if I tell you draw the frequency spectrum of S of T, the message is this, this, the blue one. It draw the frequency spectrum of the spreading code, chip code we call it, CS of T, it's this purple one. Draw the multiplication of pulse signals, it's this, the green one. As you can see, the signal was originally like this, after you multiply it by the chip sequence, it spreads and the power reduces. And this scales with the with the chip sequence. The faster the chip sequence, the more spreading you will get in your channel. Spread bandwidth by large factor, G. D spread by multiplying by CS. As Just like using I-50 and D-50, at the transmitter here, you use spreading sequence. At the receiver, you use the spreading sequence one more time to get your signal back to its original form. Again, why? Because CS multiplied by CS gives one, as if you are not doing anything. You decancel, cancel what you have done at the transmitter when you multiply by the same code at the receiver. Mitigates ISI and narrowband interference. Why narrowband interference? I told you, if you have interference here, only part of your signal will be affected, not the whole part. Narrowband interference rejection. How does this happen? You have your information signal. You multiply it by the chip sequence. You get the green one. So if you have interference on this, on this bandwidth, you get affected only little for little bandwidth, while the others are not affected. While if you are transmitting the signal as is and the interference happens, your signal will be Cancelled, totally suppressed. That's why we call it, we call it, it's a technique that's robust against jamming. Yes. What do you mean by chip sequence? Like what chip sequence is... Is it physical? Yeah, like... like the chip. Yeah, the chip produces this sequence. Oh. And you multiply, the, this sequence is very fast. Like the clock of your computer, of your, of the CPU. From there, directly you take it. From the microcontroller, there is clock producer. From there you get it, but very fast, very fast. This chip installed inside your phone to produce that chip and gets multiplied by your modulated data. Now, this is narrowband interference rejection by the factor of 1 over k, and you have multipath rejection. Multipath rejection, you have your signal here, and you transmit it after spreading, you get multiple paths, yes? Now, this will be affected, the multipath will be affected little compared to the case if you transmitted the signal without spreading. So that's why we call it, it's also robust against multipath. 
can coherently beside in addition to that you can coherently combine all multipath components via a receiver called rack receiver or finger receiver how does this work you get you, you have multipath channel now because you have you are using large bandwidth short symbol duration and your signal this you get it you, you, you get multipath of it and you want to make use of all these paths because they are carrying energy for your signal and you want to collect this energy so that your SNR is enhanced and then your bit error rate decreases you enhance your reliability so you multiply, you synchronize to the first path the location of the first path and multiply it by the chip and you get the first path we say and you delay here this path, you, this branch you delay it by TC duration like approximately close to the duration between the multi path and multiply it by the same sequence but delayed you get another path and here you get another path you have one path here one path here one path here now what you do you sum all of these together using maximum ratio combining instead of having SNR of 5 you are getting 15 now or the, it, in, it improves your performance significantly now when SNR increases what affects also not only your bit error rate it, you can explain it from two different perspectives. You can say either my bit error rate will be improved and my reliability will enhance, or you can say my coverage area will extend. Yes, instead of covering two kilometer, now you can cover three, five, because you have three dB gain, five dB gain. Three dB is doubling the power. These components can be coherently combined using selection combining. Those are, we explained them in the previous lecture about diversity. Selection combining, maximum ratio combining, equal gain combining. Equal gain combining, you co-phase all the branches and sum them equally, without any weights. While in maximum ratio combining, you co-phase and sum with optimal weights. And selection combining, you select the best path corresponding to the best channel. Which one performs the better? MRC, then EGC, then SC. This is how they are, one, two, or three, if you were to rank them based on the performance. Now, this is what, this is uh, spread the spectrum and the things that I want you to know about spread the spectrum. Now, in real wireless systems, we don't have single input, single output. We don't have only one transmitter and one receiver. We have multiple users communicating with the base station and the base station is communicating with multiple users. So we have two types of channels. We have uplink channel, the transmitter, the, the transmitter sending information to the base station receiver simultaneously, all of them together. And we have downlink channel where the receiver, the transmitter is talking to the receivers. The downlink channel, we call it broadcast channel. One transmitter talking to one receiver. The uplink channel, we call it multi-axis channel where many receivers talking to one receiver. The job of the receiver in this case to cancel these signals, separate them and decode each user data separately so that I understand how to do, how to, where to forward it, what to do with it. The job of the receiver here in the downlink channel is to get the composite signal, to get his own signal from the composite signal that contains the signal of all users. Uplink and downlink typically duplexed in time or frequency. You, you synchronize it in time or frequency. For example, if the uplink is in frequency 1, the downlink should be in frequency 2. If the uplink in time 1, the downlink should be in time 2, because otherwise you would have interference between uplink and downlink. It's enough the interference that we are having because of multiple users. Also interference because of downlink and uplink, you cannot handle it. It's the, and this edge is the channel affecting your received signal. In 5G, full duplex radios are being considered. Full duplex means the transmit and receive simultaneously at the same time, same frequency. But this has many issues actually and difficult to design the transceiver structure. That's why usually they are stick to duplexing in time and the frequency. Like in time, we call it. Time division duplexing, TDD, you have heard of this name, TDD, time division duplexing, 
or FDD frequency division duplexing. Now, when you talk to your friend via phone, you don't hear, you, you don't feel this, that each one of you is way. In time division duplexing, we are giving you one millisecond and your friend one millisecond, one millisecond, one millisecond. Now, because your hearing sensitivity is less than one millisecond, you don't feel it. Like, the video framing we are uh, we are showing you 32 frames per second your eye resolution cannot feel this flickering the the light the lid the lid usually modulates the light some very quickly your eye cannot see for example we can now with, with visible light communication you, you can get your data from the light we are modulating the light very quickly, so fast that your eye cannot recognize it. So, if you can do such thing, it's acceptable also. How to share the band within multiple, uh, multiple axis schemes? We have different techniques. Now, all these, the goal here is to divide the resources according to the user's needs or the application's needs or requirements. So, you have many techniques to do that. Either you divide the, res the time resources, you, get, you allow the users to get all the frequency and you divide in time between them, like, it, like in telephone, in telephony system. Also GSM, but GSM uses time division and frequency division. You d divide the frequency and divide the time. How it divides the frequency says that the first 10 user they will use frequency F1, let's say 900 megahertz. Within this frequency, there, there will be eight time slots. Each user can be locked one time slot, and this keeps switching between them. This millisecond, I take the sample from this user. This second, I take the sample from the next user. Next, next. Quickly, you don't feel the delay. We have code division multiplexing also. Code division multiplexing says take the users, all the users, take whole time, whole bandwidth, but each user is assigned a specific code. Code cross correlation dictates interference. For, uh, now, there is a problem here. You can use this to a limit. Why? Because of the cross correlation between the codes that you assign to the users. Interference keeps adding on, adding on, adding on to a limit. Then, after that limit, you cannot use any more codes. That's why this system is limited. Theoretically, you can say that this can serve infinity number of users, but practically this is not the case because interference is usually correlated. Cross correlation, there is cross, although the code designed to be orthogonal, but when they pass through the channel and this, you will see that there is kind of correlation between them and this correlation increases interference between the users and as the number of codes increases the interference increases and your system becomes saturated means you cannot add any more codes re which reflects to the fact that you cannot add any more users to your system if it was working properly we didn't then we didn't need to go for 4G and invent OFDM Space division, space division, we, we assign each user to a beam, and this beam is very narrow that it cannot interfere, it cannot cause interference to the other beams. Like this user, you assign this beam, this user, you assign this beam. What's the problem with this technique? The problem when you have many users, high density of users in a certain location, the beams you assign to the users will leak to each other, will interfere and cause interference. So this solution also has some drawbacks. Each solution has some benefits and some demerits. But usually there is also hybrid schemes that are used, like in OFDM we use hybrid. We use time with the frequency combined with overlapping. In, CD, in 3G we use code, is, Space is also used in 4G and 4G+. Plus. We are using in, in, no, in 5G, for example, they propose using non-orthogonal code, NOMA, non-orthogonal multiple axis. They, they assign, the, they assign the, the signals of the users to be super, superimposed on top of each other. 
and send them to the user more efficient you use more whole bandwidth whole time and you just superimpose on top of each other and no codes that are orthogonal to each other in this case but also it has some limitation and the drawback so wherever you invent or come up with a new thing you will have some benefits but also you will have some drawbacks so the goal here after you come up with something is maximize this benefit as much as you can and try to handle and mitigate the other uh, problems associated with this technique now what about th these techniques are we call them scheduled multiple access schemes scheduled means there is a coordinator base station that coordinates you the user one should be allocated two time slots one frequency user two because he's using video should be allocated three four time slots and two frequencies user three should be allocated frequency number six with time slots number 12 13 16. this is what is scheduling in multiple access schemes so the base station keeps synchronizing these things while this in networks where we have multiple users like internet of things systems or wi-fi you cannot keep handling this because it causes signaling overhead you keep communicating handshaking with the receiver you take these resources now you take these resources now leave these resources too too much communication happening between the transmitter and receiver this burdens the network and reduces its efficiency so in scheduled multiple access, channels are assigned by a centralized controller. The base station talks to all the user. It requires a central controller, guarantees high quality of service by avoiding collision, make sure why, why I'm doing all these communications with the users. To make sure there is no collision, there is no interference. Everybody takes his own signal only. But this requires extensive signaling communication talking coordinating organizing so that's why this kind this type of multiple access is considered considered inefficient in certain scenarios especially for the case for the scenarios where you have short and or infrequent data transmission like sensing you have sensor you don't know when the sensor will send data and this data is short not much so you cannot allocate resources and this for random, sporadic uh, nature of channel access. So that's why we sometimes need to use random access. Users access channel randomly without coordination, without synchronization. There is no controller to manage this. When they have data to send, they just quickly send. Give me example on this. The network, the data uh, computer networks work like this without scheduling. Yes? What, what do you do in uh, data network? You have collision, then backup, window, then wait for some time and resend your packet. Yes? Yes, isn't it? In Wi Fi network, you are using the same random access. We have example on random access slotted Aloha and Aloha. Aloha send packet whenever data is available. No synchronization. When I have data, I just throw it, send it through the network. Now, a collision occurs for any partial overlap, like you transmit your signal here, and the other user transmitted after half second from your transmission, and you haven't finished your transmission, you will have overlap, partial overlap. This causes interference. Packets received in error are retransmitted one more time. So you, you transmit your data through the network, yes? And you wait for an act. If you don't receive this act within certain period of time, this means that you, your packet didn't reach the receiver. You retransmit the packet one more time after random time. You keep retransmitting until you reach certain threshold in terms of latency or until the reception is successful. Slotted Aloha, instead of making this you transmit at any time, 
they fix the they they uh, they organize the transmission in such a way that you are allowed to transmit in certain in slots, not at any time at slots at the beginning of each slot. So if an interference happens, the interference will be fully overlap. So you will only retransmit your signal when there is fully overlap interference. Same as Aloha, but with packet slotting, packets sent during predefined pre time slots. A collision occurs when packets overlap, but there is no partial overlap like the case of Aloha. Packets received in error are retransmitted after random delay interval. Actually, this Aloha and slotted Aloha, they were in, the, in university. I don't know the name of the university the students were able to come up with this, and it was breakthrough. How to allow money users to communicate over the network. That was really something uh, groundbreaking at that time. From that time, computer networks failed and science started with this, with these algorithms. You have pure aloha, slotted aloha, you have carrier sense, multiple axis, carrier sense, multiple axis, collision avoidance, you send the channel, you sense the channel between you before you transmit. If there is a signal, if there is energy in the signal in the channel, this means there is a transmission. I wait. Back off, random window, back off. You remember there is a, in computer networks there is one two lectures dedicated to that process. So the main points that I want you to know about uh, multiple axes and spread spectrum are summarized as follows: spread spectrum increases signal signal bandwidth above what you need for information transmission. The benefit of this technique is avoiding intersymbol interference or mitigating it and rejecting narrowband interference. Also used as a multi-user, multi-access technique where you assign different codes to, to different users. Multiple access, in multiple access techniques, users can share the same spectrum via time or frequency or code or space. You must have, if you want them to avoid interference, you must have a domain that separates them from each other. This domain can be time, can be frequency, can be code, can be space, can be power, can be anything that you invent. But the most important thing that they don't interfere with each other. Random access is a method that's used when you have too many users accessing the network and, it, uh, and sending low data rates, so it's inefficient to keep communicating with them and asking them about their needs. So you allow them to access the network randomly, but the collision will be more here and the delay more, and the service is not guaranteed. But the good thing, you can serve more users. In 5G, they are studying now guaranteed access and uh, unguaranteed, or uh, what do they call it? Schedule free, no scheduling. You have data, you transmit it immediately because in 5G, one of the targets is to be able to serve Internet of Things devices, ultra reliable low latency. How can you have, how can you achieve low latency if you don't allow the user until you assign resources for him? Talk to him, shake hand with him, and then agree which resources you, are, you can give to this user. So this, these are the main points. Now let's talk a little bit about cellular system design. Now we, up until now we talked about single link communication and then we talked about uplink and downlink within a cell. But now the system is only is not only a link, is not only a cell, it's, it's a geographical region where you want to serve million, millions of users. So what do you do to serve millions of users? Previously, one time I gave you the example, I told you when, the, when a company wants to build a telecommunication business, wireless communication business, like Turkcell, like Spring, like any of these carriers, any of these carriers, so the government assigned them, let's say, two megahertz of bandwidth and tell them you can use this spectrum to serve your users. And I told you two megahertz, if each user is using uh, like video or um, applications that require large bandwidth and let's say just assume that each user requires quarter megahertz then these two megahertz how many users they can serve 
quarter to eight because two over one over four eight you can only with this band will serve eight users in a cell in a region but i have in my network million users how am i gonna serve them this is where you need to reuse your resources at a different geographical area but what's the condition to reuse your resources what's the condition no interference and how can i make sure there is no interference if i can kill my signal at this point if i can put blocks here if i can put walls where the signal cannot penetrate but in practice i cannot do this i can this whole 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 this whole region is divided into cells like this virtual cells and there is interference between them you cannot avoid it but the good thing that the signals decays, the signal amplitude decays as it travels with distance. So you assign the power of your signal at the transmitter in such a way that after one kilometer, it's below the threshold of your receiver. So you kill your signal exactly here by your design, by your intelligent design. Usually, you cannot kill it perfectly. Why? Because the environment changes. Sometimes there is a blockage. Sometimes there is no blockage. That's why there is interference always at the edge of the cell. And we call it edge interference, cell edge interference. This is the worst position any user can be located at. Your data, here you get one, meg, one giga. When you reach the edge, barely you can get one mega. Hardly. So to avoid, there are many techniques in the literature to avoid this problem. Try to improve the performance of cell edge users, and this always happens when you are crossing multiple cells. This is, this is noise. This becomes noise after. Becomes interference, which is like treated like noise because you cannot cancel it. So, so the point here is how to optimize your power. Reduce. And locate the frequencies to multiple cells in such a way that you minimize this interference. That, now, the question is, the interference, this interference between cells, increases as you increase the cell size or decrease the cell size. As you, dec as you increase the cell size, your signal decays fast, less interference. But when you, dec when you increase the cell size, you need more power, and if you have more users, the bandwidth will not be enough for them. So this trade-off is killing our design systems. That's why there is a trade-off between the maximum capacity you can achieve with the bandwidth that you are assigned, that you are given by the government, and the interference between the cells. So engineers are striving always, always to try to balance these two factors. So frequencies time slots codes reused at spatially separated locations, exploits power fall off with distance, which is bad loss, best efficiency obtained with minimum reuse distance. Minimum reuse distance means if you can create a cell within each five meter square, you are your network is amazing. It has extreme capacity. But what's the problem? You need more base station, more installation, more equipment, and you increase the interference because your signal does not decay very fast when your cell is small. To avoid that, you reduce the power and you use antenna tilting where the antenna is not like this, is like this, just on top of the users where the signal penetrates from into the ground and if it gets reflected, reflected to the sky. Does not affect any other user around the area. Antenna tilting and power reduction. So that's why the power of femtocells, there are, you see Wi-Fi access point inside your building, there is femtocells for uh, inside buildings by the carrier. These femtocells, they have low power to avoid interference, but they can serve more users. Base stations perform centralized control functions, and this helps us in maintaining the quality of service. Yeah, these functions include call setup, handoff, routing, when do you decide to handoff, when do you decide to call. One of the most critical problems that 
anybody can really think of is how the cells communicate with each other and manage to hand to transfer your call over the air when you are crossing the boundaries between the cells and you don't feel it it's 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 sharing yeah sharing data and sharing information but it's very critical when to do the handoff when to jump when to move to the other base station you cannot you cannot do more than one time you can so it's critical the decision where you at which point of time you need you must jump to the other base station lock to it it's one of the most difficult design parameters actually in cellular systems Interference results in signal to interference noise ratio above desired target. Signal to interference noise ratio depends on base station location, user locations. For example, if I ask you where is the signal to interference noise ratio greater or higher? In the center or edge? Signal to interference noise ratio higher in the center. In the edge, because your signal decays with distance and also gets affected by interference from other signals. So as you move towards the edge, your interference increases and power decreases. That's why, that's why the users who are far from the base station always in a bad shape. They don't get the, the data rate they need. That's why your Wi-Fi access point has 100 meter range. After 100 meter. The path loss kills your signal, and the interference, the signals which are stronger coming from the other base, kills your signal at that location. If we didn't have this problem, your signal can go to, uh, can cover large distances with good quality while you are still getting. That's why they say at 10 meter you get 50 megahertz, at 100 meter you get barely 10 mega. 10 mega. You understood this relationship. The propagation affects interference effect. System capacity is interference limited. Now, when someone asks you what's the capacity of a system like this, nobody knows the exact capacity of a system like this. It's very hard to predict. But the capacity, virtually, if you can design your system into small cells and ensure no interference, the capacity can go to extreme large values that you can reach infinity. Infinity means your pay station is single point, locked, each, pay, each user has his own pay station, which is uh, somehow impractical. MIMO introduces diversity multiplexing interference reduction. We have MIMO alignment techniques that can reduce the interference. Multi-user detection reduces inter intracell interference. Actually, they, the, most of the work in this domain is to reduce the interference. You have interference cancellation, interference reduction, interference mitigation, interference management, interference coordination, interference avoidance. All methods and techniques trying to handle, because interference, why this problem is so important? Because if you avoid interference, you increase your signal to noise ratio, you increase your capacity and increase your reliability. It's so critical. Multi user detection. Now, all the users, if the signal is broadcasting your signal in all the directions, each user gets the other user signals. But you have to get only your signal. How do you do that? Either you use maximum likelihood, it's very complex. As the number of users increases, I explained to you the maximum likelihood where you need to compare with all the symbols and users and data points. Very complex. Or you use successive interference cancellation. It's less complex, but does not give you optimal performance. So again, you have this trade-off. As you can see, in most of the techniques that we have presented and studied so far, they have this kind of trade-off improve something but also add in the other thing so what determines what to use the application the requirements of your application the requirements of your service the requirements of your customer your customer cares about only high capacity or the cares about high reliability you decide but if he cares about everything 
then I think uh, these systems might not be sufficient to, to this customer. We might need to build a new system from scratch. This is the signal, you get the signal and you try to detect your the desired signal for each user and then subtract. This successful interference cancellation, we use it in NOMA technique, which is non-orthogonal multiple axis where the signal users are superimposed in power domain. So the area and spectral efficiency, one of the metrics that we use, we studied the spectral efficiency for the modulation schemes, but also we have something called aerial spectral efficiency. Aerial spectral efficiency is defined as follows. What's the maximum bit per second per hertz that you can provide within kilometer square? So what well, Area spectral efficiency is important when you have dense network. You have large amount of users like in the stadium. Thousands of users located in few kilometers, few meters square, yes? So here, well, you need to serve all of them simultaneously. How are you going to do that if your area spectral efficiency is not high? One of the critical techniques that can improve your aerial spectral efficiency is massive MIMO. Massive MIMO can, can serve multiple users simultaneously. NOMA can serve, but not much. Uh, actually, we need huge research is going on just trying to increase this aerial spectral efficiency as much as you can. What's the best thing to do if you can do? is to allocate the whole bandwidth of your system to each user and make sure no interference between this user and the other users in, the, in this area. <laughs> Dido thing, Dido Hesel. But, but, but I, th that one is not yet very common and implemented in all the networks. Yes? Direct antenna. Direct antenna, but how are you going to design the beams? I told you the problem with the space division multiple axis using directional antennas. They have side loops and the beam, you cannot make it very narrow. If you make it very narrow, any slight movement, you misalign with the beam, you lose your data. And you cannot make it very wide because it will interfere with the other users. And when you have multiple users with, within the beam, how are you going to serve all of them? So it's also challenging. So. For example, the, as the cell radius increases, your area spectral efficiency decreases, and as the diameter increases, your area spectral efficiency increases at a certain frequency. Signal to interference increases with reused distance. The more you reuse your bandwidth, your frequencies, the more interference you get. But more capacity you provide, increased link capacity. Trade-off between reuse distance and link spectral efficiency, they are against each other. You enhance one, you reduce the other. Capacity increases exponentially as cell size decreases. When you uh, decrease your coverage, as if you are allocating your whole bandwidth to short, uh, smaller area. Smaller area means, I mean, you can, all the users within this area getting this whole bandwidth. So the overall system capacity increases, but the interference increases as well. Future cellular systems will be hierarchical, where large cells for coverage, small cells for capacity. Now with the millimeter wave in 5G, they say that 3G, 4G, 2G networks, this for signaling, control information only, and your data, your traffic must go through millimeter wave frequency, 60 gigahertz and so. So it's kind of this trade-off because amount of data generated by users is exponentially growing and increasing and you need more faster internet. Everybody agrees on that. You need faster internet, you need larger space size for your data. Why? Because the amount of data you are generating, each and every user, is increasing dramatically. Like YouTube, YouTube, for example, YouTube. Do you know the size of the data center of YouTube? 
Now, when you host a website, like suppose you create a website uh, for yourself and host it, this website has only a few files. You can, that's why we have this shared hosting services. A uh, hundred websites for hundred users, each user is using a few files. They are on one single computer, one single server. But YouTube have millions of videos, each video within a space, within a size. How many hard drives you need? How many? How many? One website of a space of like, I don't know how much, but it can be uh, like factory. I don't know how much that website is occupying. So why? Because video is becoming viral. Nobody is using text in the future. All the traffic will be due to video. Already happening. All the traffic is due to video. If you have fast internet and you have something to save your data, why don't you go for video? You would go. You would increase the data. You would need more bandwidth from the network. So we are still in shortage of this. Speed, high speed internet and size. Yeah, it's really, really this is the challenge. This is what drives the research and innovation in this field. Computer and communication, they are linked with each other hand by hand. Computer tries to make the spacing more efficient, storage, RAM, processing, and the, the communication guys, the bandwidth, the transmission, the links, the speeds. So your server sometimes can handle 10 gigabit per second, the port, but the channel cannot, the bandwidth cannot. So you need them to go hand to hand with each other. You understand the relationship, the link, this and that. It's very comprehensive and highly correlated areas affected by each other. So last thing I would like to talk about it and give you uh, like teach you about is the link budget and the propagation losses. Now I, previously we talked about free space. Uh, Fresh equation, pathless equation, free space model. Uh, if you are transmitting BT, uh, you are in the cell, in the center here. The base station is transmitting and it has user on the edge. And the base station is trying to serve the user with the required signal to noise ratio so that, so that he can use the application he needs, like voice or video or whatever. So how to determine the power at the transmitter, the needed power. Because if you increase the power more, you would interfere in cause interference. If you reduce it, you will not allow your receiver to receive your data correctly. So how to design this, the transmit power, in such a way that it's optimal to the need of the user? How? You tell me, okay, first I will need to calculate the distance from the base station. And from this I calculate the path loss. How much loss due to distance? And then you tell me how many buildings on the way. And then I calculate the shadowing, the loss due to shadowing. I call the loss due to path loss LB. The loss due to shadowing LS, shadow. And also tell me, I want to estimate how fast the channel is changing, the fast fading ups and downs. And I call this fast fading margin, LF, due to fading. And also tell me the receiver at which point, at which threshold of signal to noise ratio or power can detect the signal. Then I can tell you what's the power I need to transmit for that user. So, the minimum, the transmit power you need to transmit to the user is the minimum power at the receiver that at which the receiver can decode the signal. Plus, the margin due to fading plus the margin due to shadowing, plus the margin due to path loss, all in dB. This is the optimal power. This is the power you need to allow. No more, no less. You increase more, you cause interference. You reduce, your receiver cannot detect. The more you optimize this, the more you track it, the more you make it optimal according to the needs of the users, the more your overall performance will be much better. So this is the link budget thing that I just wanted you to know about it. So the main points that we need to consider regarding that, 
Cellular systems reuse time frequency codes in space. Interference managed to meet signal to interference noise ratio. Interference reduction increases capacity in general. That's why we care too much about interference reduction and all the techniques related to interference. MIMO traits diversity multiplexing interference reduction. We have also the multi-user detection that that's used to mitigate the interference through joint or successive detection. Area spectral efficiency captures system capacity and we try always to increase it as much as we can and one of the methods to do that is massive MIMO. Small cells and reuse one distance typically of next generation cellular. The future for wireless system trying to reduce the cell size and use the whole bandwidth if we can to one single user if it's possible. That would be the optimal the optimal scenario. Of course, without interference, try to reduce the interference. So with this, we conclude the lecture and thank you very much for your attention and meet you in the next lecture.